Um, let, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about you know these two as how, how they might compare because you, you explained that the challenges facing Doravel right now. If you had to do a combined eleven. Might you actually have more? <laughs> Look, I don't, I, I don't want to make this a meme, but honestly, would you maybe have more English players? Well, in English... Fala, meu convocado. Até que enfim a seleção brasileira vai encarar seleções europeias em data FIFA, Inglaterra e depois a Espanha. A Inglaterra já é amanhã. E será que os ingleses deveriam comemorar mesmo pela primeira vez desde que eles inventaram o futebol? A seleção deles é melhor que a nossa? Qual a sua opinião? É isso que a gente vê a partir de agora aqui no Seleção do Mundo. Não se esqueça de se inscrever aqui no canal, ajudar a gente a chegar aos 100 mil inscritos e, claro, compartilhar esse vídeo também, deixar sua opinião aí porque ela é muito importante para a gente interagir. Bora ver! Ok, let's dive a little bit deeper as far as the uh, Brazilian team are concerned. Big, big, big summer ahead. Copa América to look forward to, as you can see, to Victory South American football experts here alongside me. Great to see you in the studio as well. Great to see you in the flesh, Tim. I mean, no normally it's via Zoom, however we can chat to you. It's but the always... only flesh I've got, and it's decaying. <laughs> but, uh, as, as they say in the land of your own sisters, Chévere. Chévere, muy chévere. Very, yeah, very cool, very good, very good. Um, yes, uh, my ancestors are Colombian, for those who don't know. It's not like I don't mention it every other week. I kind of do. Um, right, OK, um, this game. England versus Brazil, back in back in Brazil, how, how much attention is this getting? Plenty. Now, let's we can look through the long lens or the close lens. Let's look through the long lens first. Brazil last won the World Cup in 2002. Every campaign since then has ended when they've come up against the European side in the knockout stage. Mm. Over the last few years, a little bit because of the pandemic, but principally because of Europe's Nations League, there haven't been dates for the South Americans to play European opposition. And since Russia 2018, Brazil have come to Europe one game against the Czech Republic in 2019. So they've been crying out, they and the other South American nations have been crying out for more opportunities mm. to play European teams. Mm. Now, the rapprochement between UEFA and Comnibol, which is South America's UEFA, um, brought about the finalissimo. Now, that, that game yeah, at Wembley where, where yeah. Argentina saw off Italy. And it's also meant that this FIFA date has been established yeah. specifically, really, for the South Americans to have a chance to play against the Europeans. Mm. So we've got lots of games going on. Colombia are against, uh, against Spain, Spain and the other, against yeah, Romania. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ecuador face Italy. That's their first friendly against European opposition wow. since, since they faced England in a warm-up for the, the 2014 World Cup. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So that, that, that's the long lens. Yeah, yeah. They want practice against European opposition. The shorter lens, this has come at an awkward time for Brazil. We're six rounds into World Cup qualification. Brazil are in sixth place. Yeah. They, this is unprecedented. Yeah. They've yeah. lost three games on the bounce. It's a brand new coach, Dorival Jr., coming in. He's, he's, he's spent a long career as player, as coach, exclusively in Brazil. So this is a big test for, for him. Uh, and there are easier places to start your career as an international coach <laughs> than against England and against Spain. Yeah, 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 absolutely right. Tell us a little bit more about Dorival and, and how he's got to the place that he's got to now, because there has been a fair turnover of managers. Hasn't yes, there? there has. Um, Dorival, he's that kind of guy who's easy to underestimate. He was often seen as a kind of short-term fix. I don't find him particularly inspiring, frankly. Often, he, when he speaks, sometimes he reminds me of a kind of... Soviet apparatchik explaining away <laughs> disappointing production figures. But that's part of it. He's low ego. There's not a lot of ego there with, with Dorival. Uh, and, and that means that over his career, he's been able to bend his ideas to the talent at his disposal. Now, his big task, and this is more important, I think, than the results against England or Spain next week, his big task, he's got to win over the likes of Vinicius Jr. and Rodrigo and the Premier League players. Mm. He's got to win them over. He's got to show them that he's not just a coach of Brazilian domestic football, that he can go global. It's interesting when you said at the start there that he's, you know, one that can be easily underestimated, um, originally seen as more of a potentially a stopgap. Isn't that what Gareth Southgate was at right at the very start? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. But there is a difference. Yeah. yeah. Southgate, 50, more than 50 caps for England. Yeah, yeah. And he came through... The system, of the course, system. Yeah, yeah. And that, that I think, has yeah. been very important. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Phil Foden, I'm sure, will remember, through that system, yeah. taking Brazil to the cleaners in the semi-final of the World Under-17 Cup course. back in 2017. Yeah. Yeah. And those players have kept on coming through the system. Yeah, they were already bought in when Southgate was appointed, for sure. Yeah, it's a really good point to mention. Um, let's talk about one player in particular, um, Richarlison. Back in the squad, very candidly saying that 
therapy saved his life. Give us the picture again back, back in Brazil. Did people then know how much he was suffering? How much is this talked about, this issue in Brazil? Well, you know, Brazil, when they won the World Cup for the first time in 1958, they took a sports psychologist. That's how open they were. He was absolutely useless. <laughs> he recommended that Pelé's got to be dropped. He was, he was useless. But it, it shows how open-minded they were to this. And it is frequent, the use of sports psychologists, but usually collectively. Right. An individual, and football people don't like to open up with their weaknesses. Mm. It's a very competitive mm. environment. So Richarlison has been extremely brave to do this, and whatever gets him goals, it works. Yeah, and cu culturally in Brazil, is that something that is really respected? Is it something that is sort of a bit quizzical? Look, you know, when someone comes out and is quite so personal, quite so open? I think there's less resistance to it than there is in this country. Okay. Um, go a little bit further south, Argentina, Buenos Aires, it has more psychologists per square metre than any, any place in the world. Is that right? Yeah, so it's a nice wow. excuse to talk about themselves, I think. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, Br Brazil and this squad, um, you know, we're saying that the, the, the coach is, is someone who has, you know, not the greatest of track records so far. He's still establishing himself in the game and, you know, certainly at this level. What about the squad? I mean, 18 of the players have five or fewer yeah. caps. So, obviously, the, the next question to ask is which of these are going to be catching the eye that we should be keeping an eye out for? Yeah, it, it's, it's tough for the coach because he's lost so much experience yeah. with people pulling out. He's lost the two goalkeepers, uh, Edison and Alisson. He's lost the two centre-backs, Marquinhos and Gabriel Magalhães. He's lost Casemiro. So he, he you know... It, it's, that spine it's, is looking a bit different, isn't it? It is, yeah. 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 So uh, this game, I think, it's going to be important for the midfielders. Um, the fullbacks, a lot of them are not, some of them are not great defensively. Who's going to balance out that team? It's probably going to be a first cap for Joao Gomes of mm -hmm. Wolves, mm -hmm. who worked very successfully with Dorival Jr. Um, in Fl at Flamengo a couple of years ago. He was the lung power that balanced out that, that, that Flamengo side. I think it's a really important match for him, maybe for Douglas Luiz as well. We're going to find out a lot about those Brazilian central midfielders in this game. The one I think that everyone wants to see is the next wonder kid off the production line, who is 17-year-old Endrick. Mm -hmm. And he is, he is special. Stocky, little, left-footed striker. You wouldn't really see him as a, as a natural centre-forward. He has played there. He can also play a little bit off. But there is real talent there. There is speed. And also, you know that, that wonderful calm in front of goal? Mm -hmm. The finisher who looks like he's passing the ball into, yeah. the, into the back Just of the Just the utter composure of it all. He's got that about him. Yeah. I found out something... Um, which I thought was a, he, he was a key figure last year when his team Palmeiras won the, the, the Brazilian championship. And one of the opposing centre backs said, You know what he does during the game? He sings. He sings away to himself. You know, <laughs> I, I, I had a chat with him a, a couple of months ago. I said, What do you sing? What's, he wouldn't give me the repertoire. I don't know. <laughs> so maybe after Saturday's game, the England players can tell us what Hendrick has Yeah, seen. well, we'll find out. We'll find out. Um, I mean, again, it's a, that sense of, I suppose, aura and calm. And, you know, being very much in, in the moment of That's why of he says he game. does it. It, it, it. I mean, actually, it helps. Him. Interestingly, you know, another player, not that it's related to this, but another player who's spoken the same way about sport and about sort of the big occasion, handling pressure, all those sort of things, Johnny Wilkinson has mentioned this as well, this kind of, you know, you can get too into the detail, but actually you need that distance mm -hmm. and that real kind of calm. I wonder whether he might end up, you know, having some sort of story career that, that really does, you know, uh, reflect that. Off to Real Madrid in the summer. Johnny Wilkinson? No, not, not, um, yet. not yet. Uh, <laughs> um, let, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, these two as how, how they might compare, because you, you explained that the challenge is facing Dorival right now. If you had to do a combined 11, might you actually have more... <laughs> Look, I don't, I, I don't want to make this a meme, but honestly, would you maybe have more English players? Well, in interesting, this because I've seen people over here do this and look at the two squads and think, you know what, ours is better. There's more... Would... And you could say... And some might say, oh, yeah, English arrogance. But <laughs> 10 days ago in Brazil, we were having exactly the same discussion on the Brazilian media. Okay. And this, I think, is unprecedented. Uh, and this is part, I think, of the problems that Brazil have had yeah. um, winning World Cups because the bar is higher. Let's remember the game, the fatal game, the quarterfinal when they lost against Belgium in, mm. in Russia 2018. There's one player on the field who is absolutely stereotypically South American. Low centre of gravity, unpredictable, <laughs> wonderful in one-against-one one situations. It's not Brazilian, is he? It's, it's, it's Eden Hazard. Hazard. Yeah. Europe has learned yes. Yes. to produce 
talent. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of that talent, we talked about Phil Foden, a lot of that talent has been brought on by Gareth Southgate and others yeah. through, through the system. Yeah. So I think it's harder for Brazil. Yeah. There are things where Brazil used to have a monopoly and now the Europeans are doing it as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's interesting how it's shifted. And, and talking about, we mentioned Endrick before, but we asked you to pick out three standout young players from South America who we could see in the Premier League in years to come. This is where we really pick your brains and get you finding out those it's not names. not there, but you can go into <laughs> anything that there is. Let's have a look at this first one. So, so Ben, when you mentioned that the problems that, um, that, that, that Dodi Bell's got, you know, without Edison and Alisson, maybe this man comes right in. Could well be his, his, his first cap. Brazil has become, you don't really associate Brazil with goalkeepers, but it's become a mass producer and exporter of goalkeepers. And this one is, is the next taxi off the rank. He's 24, which is a little bit, for any other position, it will be a little bit, young, a little bit old yeah. to come straight out of South yeah. America. Yeah. And the European clubs want them as young as they can possibly get them. Goalkeepers obviously mature a little bit later. He's a very solid citizen. There's an air of calm around him. He's, he's big, he's athletic, uh, he's, he's not particularly flashy. Mm. Big day for him mm. on Saturday because it's a real chance for him to put himself in the shut window. OK, keep an eye on that one. Um, that's the Brazilian covered, I suppose. We're going to go now to Argentina. What can you tell us about Franco Mastantuono? Well, isn't it amazing just how Italian Argentina yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. You know, the first time I went there, I thought, why are you speaking Italian to me? <laughs> uh, 16 years old. OK. Already getting a game, sometimes off the bench, sometimes starting, for River Plate to a very interesting side, coached by Martin Di Michelis, the former ah, yeah. Man City. And he's, he's an interesting... It's his first proper job. He did Bayern Munich youth. Yeah. Uh, and uh, th there's interesting things here. I think Di Michelis is a name you might be seeing on this side of the Atlantic as well. Mm -hmm. This fella... Uh, you, can't, you couldn't buy him until next summer. He turns 18 in next August. Um, he's a left-footed attacking midfielder with poise. Very, uh, he can cut in, he can go outside, and he, he, he seems to know which decision to take, okay. which as a 16-year-old pitched into to, to senior football, I think is something that really makes him stand out. I'm getting this, this, this sort of little light motif. You know, young players, OK, yes, yeah, so, so Ben was 24, but, you know, other players in Franco Mastantuono that calm, that just that ability to, to just slow down the game and take the right decisions and be optimal in that, you know, for a young player is always very impressive. Um, OK, let's go to a Uruguayan forward, but not Darwin Nunez. No. No, Luciano Rodriguez. Um, so, yeah, so, so obviously not the Liverpool that we know over here, but the one over in Uruguay. What's so good about the not young Luciano? Long, not for long. I was just seeing today that there is interest, I think, from the City group. Um, this fella, he was a star turn last year when Uruguay won the World Under-20 Cup. Um, he's, I think he's going to get his first cap. Uruguay are playing the Basque country, and then they're playing Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, mm -hmm. over the next few days. And he's in, the, he's in the squad, and I think they'll, they'll push him through that. Uh, he's been called the Uruguayan Mbappé. Now, that's a stretch. And, oh, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but he's, he's like a horse. Uh, the running power that, that he's got. But the running power comes together with tight space skills okay. so he can play out wide and run he can play through the center uh he's, he's a good taker of set pieces brazilian he's... ronaldo any comparison well, there again i mean like again you think about the athleticism and the control yeah perhaps, or is that a stretch? perhaps but I, I wouldn't like to do that to anyone <laughs> that, that, that's a big ask yeah. um, uh, last year his, his club little liverpool they won the uruguayan championship for the first time um, so this is, this is a fellow who already is 20. He's already done impressive things. I'm surprised that he's still there. He's not going to be there for very much longer. And as I've seen today, the City group seems to be interested. OK. One very last one, very quickly. We've mentioned the men's team. We've mentioned young players. What about the picture as far as women's football is concerned in South America? I mean, the only team that made the knockout stages of the Women's World Cup were, of course, Las Cafeteras, Colombia. But what, what, where is it at right now? Brazil still are the ones... But who, what was the rest of it well, like? Well, Colombia are by far Brazil's biggest challengers. Mm. Uh, I, I remember being there more than 20 years ago now and seeing women's football played in schools in Colombia. And I was really, really surprised because, as you know, it's, it can be quite a conservative society. Mm. But the rise... Colombia is quite close to the United States culturally in mm -hmm. some ways. And the rise of women's football in the United States had, had given it a kind of legitimacy. OK. So it doesn't surprise me that Colombia have, have come through so strongly. Brazil are still, even though they had a disastrous World Cup, they're still top dogs in the continent. And look out, watch the news. In May, FIFA will decide where the next Women's World Cup will be, 2027. 
There are three candidates. The United States. It doesn't need it. It's got everything. <laughs> it's got the Men's World Cup the day Please, the, the year before. Enough already. <laughs> uh, a joint one from Holland, Belgium um, and Germany. OK. But France just had it in 2019. Uh -huh. And the other one is Brazil. Now, the stadiums are all there. It's, uh, it, it's it, the government's behind the project. And that is something that could really get the game going. Brazilian women's football rested on its laurels. The great martyr, the mm -hmm. spontaneous uh, uh, generation of talents, rested on its laurels for too long. It's now trying to play catch up. It's investing. We had uh, a weekend recently where the biggest crowd of the day was a women's final bigger than some of the big derby games. Wow. It's okay. on the move, yeah. and the 2027 World Cup can really give it a What push. an incentive that would be. Fantastic. We will keep an eye on the news in May. Well, we do all the time anyway. But thank you, Tim. I re really appreciate all of your insight, as always, and to see you here in the studio as well. It has been my pleasure. Thank you. Muchas gracias.